Well, hello again, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to part three of Love at First Like. This part is designed to discuss and introduce a concept called social presence. And the reason uh, I want to talk about this concept a little bit is because I think it's central to understanding uh, interpersonal communication and relationships and social media and, and CMC. So uh, that's why I want to talk about this concept a little bit. So before we get started talking about social presence, I want you to consider the following questions to you know to get us thinking about uh, this idea. First, um, do you think that we can feel close to people through technology? Second, if the answer is yes, do you think we can feel as close as face to face? And then third, if the answer to that one is yes, is it possible that we might be able to feel even closer to each other through technology than we do face to face? Furthermore, I want you to consider these questions again uh, at the end of this part to see if you answer them the same way as you do right now. First off, let's consider the use of technology uh, within human interaction. This is not something that's new, uh, whether it's been handwritten letters, uh, telegrams, phone calls, emails, uh, whatever the technology might be, we've long used uh, some sort of media or technology to interact with other people. However, I might offer that uh, the use of such technology has definitely increased in recent times, and this is due to the fact that more and more technologies exist uh, for us to interact with other people. Now, the other question that I think we want to consider is that we want things to be more like face-to-face, -face, right? And when we consider technologies such as social media or phone calls or whatever it might be, we tend to consider them uh, in comparison to face-to-face. -to -face. So I would offer that we want things to be like face-to-face, -face, right? Well, that's a question that I think, um, again, I want you to consider as we move throughout uh, this part. Now, before we get into our real discussion about social presence, and I know it's taking a little while to get there, uh, we're kind of taking a little bit of a roundabout way, um, but before we do it, I would ask that you click on the link here uh, and take a look and read the CNN article that, that's there. And I especially ask you to look at the pictures because I think they're, they're very interesting. So go ahead, take a, click on the link, take a few minutes to read it, and uh, I'll wait for you and be back here when you're finished. Now your first response uh, to that reading in those pictures might have been, huh, or what the hell, or something along those lines that uh, we, uh, I won't repeat here. Uh, and if that's the case, and if you found that kind of strange, you're certainly not alone. Um, many people that I've shown this to, it tends to be their first response is, this is very weird. Um, now, I might personally agree. Um, dating a video game character and marrying a video game character it is not for me. Uh, but I do think that it suggests some kind of interesting things about interpersonal relationships and technology. Uh, and this is something that I'd love to see more discussion about uh, in the various discussion formats. Now, I don't ask or expect that most of you will go on to uh, date or marry video game characters. In fact, I kind of hope not. Um, but it is something that, in this story especially, I think, is something that really does a good job of kind of introducing and thinking about our topic for today, which is social presence. So we're going to move on now to talk more about it. Now, for our discussion of uh, social presence, I want to first start by talking about something known as the media equation. The media equation, uh, you see here, is a book uh, by Reeves and Nass. Um, and uh, it was one of the first books that I read as a graduate student that really got me to know, yes, this is what I want to do. This is the stuff that I want to study and I'm interested in. And uh, I read this uh, book on the beach. Uh, you know, and it was a real page turner, and I'm not joking about that. That really, that really happened, um, because it was just incredibly interesting to me. So to give a quick rundown of what this book's about and what the media equation's about, um, basically the the book outlines a, a a whole line of research, many studies, where Reeves and Nass and some of their other colleagues and graduate students, I'm guessing, um, what they would do is they would take a psychology study or some other interpersonal relationship study that looked at how two people interacted with each other and what happened. What they would do is they would replace one of the people uh, with a computer. 
um, and they would see what would happen. Now, what do you think happens? What do you think happens in a study when you know you have an effect such as one person prefers it when another person is polite, but you would take one of those people out and you put a computer in place? Do people still prefer computers that are polite? Well, what Reeves and Nass uh, pretty consistently found is that when you replace uh, a person with a computer, we tend to get the same results as we do when it's two people interacting with each other. Now, this is kind of strange. Um, and this happens despite the fact that if you ask a person, they of course say, no, I don't care. I know it's just a computer. Um, why, I'm not going to respond to it like it's a person and so on and so forth. And yet consistently across their line of research, we see that people do respond. So we do prefer computers that are polite. We do prefer computers um, that complement another computer rather than ones that complement themselves. And in the book, they detail a whole bunch of other studies like this. Um, so if you're ever interested in more information about this, I, I definitely recommend taking a look at the, the media equation. Now, what does this mean? Well, reason NAS suggests that, you know, these studies show that media equals real life, and that is the media equation, that media equals real life. Uh, what that means is we accept media as if it's real, and we respond to it as if it's real. So we have the same responses to, for example, a computer that behaves in a human manner as we would to a person that behaves in a human manner. Now, why does this happen? They suggest that technology changes and adapts and evolves much faster than people do. Uh, and so we are still responding you know, to things that seem human as if they are because we have not changed as quickly as, as people as our technology has. So for a long time, if something looked like a person and it acted like a person, it was a person. And so it made sense to respond to it like it was a person. We have not changed quickly enough according to this perspective, to adapt to our changes in technology. And therefore, if a computer um, see, or a robot or any other kind of uh, thing along these lines, if it acts human and seems like a human, we respond to it as if it is a human. Now, this notion of the media equation, I think, is something that really helps us to understand why, part, at least partly, that social presence can occur. Um, now, to talk about social presence, we first want to talk about what the general concept of presence or telepresence is. Uh, and the classic kind of Lombard and Ditton definition is that presence is the illusion of non-mediation. In other words, um, it's feeling as if something is not mediated even when it is. Now, some other scholars have uh, recently suggested that this is not an illusion um, because illusion makes it, I think, kind of sound as if it's fake or something that's not really happening. And so they prefer the, the, the phrase perception of non-mediation, um, Tambridi and Skalski being among the ones uh, who have suggested this perception of non-mediation might, uh, might be a better way to think about it. But either way, it's the general idea that we're having some sort of mediated interaction, whether it be with another person or watching a television show or whatever it might be, and we're responding to it as if it's not mediated. So we're responding to it as if it's real. Now what you see here is people uh, sitting around a board, uh, sitting around a table having a board meeting. Um, the thing is, if you look closely at this, you may realize that some of the people are in one room and the people uh, in the far end of the picture are actually somewhere else um, and they're being projected onto screens. Now this is uh, Cisco's telepresence system. It's designed to make people feel as if they're in the same room together. I mean, if you look at the picture, if you don't look at it real closely, it looks like everyone's just sitting around one big round kind of strange shaped table, but still that they're all physically present um, with each other in the same room. Now, this I think is a demonstration of the concept of social presence, or at least an attempt to create this concept of social presence, where we're trying to make it, we're trying to make each other feel uh, and make people feel as if other people are there with them. So there are various types of telepresence, and obviously the one we're interested in, since the title of uh, this part is social presence, is social presence. 
and to kind of define what social presence is, I like these relatively simple f definitions offered by Bioka, Harms, and Burgoon, um, although they themselves also later go on to define social presence uh, in more detail. I still kind of like these these relatively simple definitions because I think they get a get a good I get across a good sense of what it what it means to feel socially present with someone. And as it says, they suggest that we can think of social presence as a sense of being with another, uh, being with another person. And we can also think about it as, you know, uh, how well did one person feel connected to another person through an interface? So they highlight the fact that this is something that, you know, this is technologically mediated. This is something that we, we feel through some sort of technology. And they also highlight the fact that uh, this seems to be some sort of feeling of connection or being with another person. And those are important concepts, I think, especially if we're going to understand relationships uh, that occur online and, and through other various forms of, uh, of mediated technology. Now, for a short break uh, from listening to me, I invite you to click on the link uh, that's provided here. And what you'll see is a video of a newsreel, a couple minutes long, um, of a story about robot seals um, that, are you, that were used in uh, helping to heal folks who were victims uh, of an earthquake in Japan. And if you watch this, I specifically want you to listen to the people's responses to these robotic seals. So the next question we want to take up is, how do we feel socially present? What leads to having this experience of social presence, of feeling connected to another person through a technology? Uh, do we need face-to-face -face interaction in nonverbals? Uh, do we need to see the other person, for example? It's not that we don't use them, because we certainly do. I mean, we use these things if they're there to remind us that there's another person there. The question is, do we need them? Can we feel connected to another person uh, even in the absence of seeing them and even in the absence of having other nonverbal information that we might have face to face? Now, what I would argue that the research on this topic um, is inconclusive at best. And what I mean by that is it might actually be conclusive suggesting that we don't need them. Uh, for example, there are studies that have suggested that we can feel social presence through things like text messaging. Text only, no nonverbals there. Um, there's also studies suggesting that sometimes having video gets in the way of feeling socially present. And so um, having a video channel actually seems to sometimes lead to less social presence than other quote-unquote leaner channels that don't allow as many nonverbals. Now, this sh maybe shouldn't come as, a, as big of a surprise if we think to letter writing, again, handwritten letters, that no nonverbals, text only, sometimes took a long time to get and to receive and then to write back and send back. So not the quickest, most efficient way of having an interaction. But if you read um, letters, for example, uh, that people would send home during World War II to their loved ones, um, you get the sense that these were something that really helped to have people feel connected to each other. So it doesn't, although we might use nonverbals when they're there, it does seem that when they're not, we still find ways of connecting to other people, even through, quote unquote, the leanest channels. So if we don't need nonverbals, uh, what do we need? Or what kinds of things really do help lead to social presence? What I'm going to provide you with now are some thoughts, um, some things that I think uh, we can really focus on and that might be the kinds of things that really help us to feel socially present with somebody else um, through social media and other uh, communication technologies. The first one is the transparency of the technology. Um, this is basically the idea of uh, how much do you see the technology? Is it, is it invisible during, while you're using it? Um, the idea here is that it's very hard to feel connected to another person through the use of technology uh, if we keep noticing the technology itself. So I, w I will ask you uh, to think about what the implications of that are. Uh, for example, it might mean that even if at first when we use a technology and it's brand new to us, we don't feel really socially present with other people, it may be that as we come to practice it and we get better at using the technology, we're able to feel more socially present using it. 
So what else uh, can help us to feel as if we're connected to another person uh, online? One of the possibilities is interaction. Just being able to carry on a conversation, um, even if it's not in real time, even if it's asynchronous. Getting a response to the messages you put out there is likely something that will remind you that there is another person out there. Um, and another one that we think uh, will likely lead to this feeling of social presence is skills. Are you better able to use the technology? And this one kind of goes along with the transparency idea. If you're better skilled just at using general technology or specific technology, like social media, for example, it's likely that you'll be better able to feel social presence uh, using that technology. Now, I want you to think about both of these uh, ideas in the fourth part when we talk more about relationship uh, development online as well. So we've talked a little bit about, about what social presence is and talked a little bit about how we might come to feel it online. The next question I want to take a little bit is, is it possible to actually feel more presence online than it is face to face? Um, and it's a question that I think most people kind of intuitively say no. There's no way, you know, face to face is, is it. But some scholars have suggested that that might not be the case. Um, that it's important to think about instead, what are the possibilities and the affordances that a technology might provide? Uh, they ask, for you know, Holman and for example, ask if face-to-face -face is really the gold standard. Is it is face-to-face -face what we want to hold everything up to? Because you have to remember, guys, that face-to-face -face interaction has its problems. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, we've had a lot of problems that have existed communicatively and in, in, in relationships that existed long before any tech, you know, any fancy technologies like social media did. Um, so it, it's important to remember that that there are characteristics of face to face that make it imperfect. Another analogy that uh, Holland Stornata point out that I really like is they suggest that we think about we often think about technology as crutches, and instead we should think about it as shoes. Now, a crutch, if you think about it, is something that is designed to prop you up and it will never allow you to walk, for example, as well as you could without the crutch. Whereas a shoe, um, depending on who you ask, because well, obviously some thought on this has changed recently, uh, is designed to help you walk better. Now we often think about and build our technologies to be crutches, to, to try to replicate face-to-face, -face, despite the fact that that might not be the best way to build one. And instead of thinking about it as a crutch, they suggest that we should think about these as shoes. What are the affordances? What are the things um, that media and tech, other communication technologies allow us to do better than face-to-face? -face? And it's in that question, and if we think about that idea, I think that allows us to start to at least think about when might technology actually allow us to feel more socially present, to feel more close, to feel a stronger relationship. And this is, again, something I want you to think about uh, in the fourth part when we move on into that one. So if we kind of tie all this in together, what does it all mean? Um, I think that it suggests that, you know, one of the big important parts of having a relationship is feeling close to the person, at least, uh, you know, a close relationship like we might have with a romantic partner or even like a close friend or something. There has to be some level of closeness. Um, and can that closeness occur and can that closeness happen through technology? I think the answer is yes. Um, now, how is it done? How do we build those relationships? We started talking a little bit about it in this part, but uh, if you tune in to the fourth part, we're definitely going to talk about that even more. and We're going to go over a couple of the ways um, that are suggested for how relationships are built online um, and how they might even be built, quote-unquote, faster and more intensely uh, than they are face-to-face. -face. So... Looking forward to talking more about that in the fourth part. Now, if you're interested in this stuff, um, here are some links that I would recommend that you can take a look at more. If you want to know a little bit more about the media equation um, without having to read the whole book, although, like I said before, I would strongly recommend taking a look at the entire book if, uh, if this is an interesting topic to you. If not, you can take a look at the Wikipedia page um, about the media equation. It provides some good information about the topic. Uh, the second link here links to the actual research article uh, from Lombard and Ditton, the classic article uh, talking about what presence is. So that's one that, you know, if you want to take a look at it in that format, you can. Third link is to a link to the uh, International Society of Presence Research, uh, their webpage, and they certainly have a lot more information about presence. 
And then the final uh, link included here is a about an hour long YouTube video. So this is one that's you know not this, this is one you have, if you want to watch you got to take a while to watch it. Um, it's a Google uh, presentation all about robots, I'm talking about how we can make uh, at least partly talking about how we can make more social robots. So if you want more information, here are some things. Of course, I can always provide others if you're interested. Uh, and I, again, look forward to talking to you guys again in the fourth part.